every new technology goes through a phase where we don't know enough about how to implement it, when to implement it, and on whom to implement it. That's where we are with this device. You can breathe in 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Breathe. How dare we? How dare we open people up and cut and sew on their heart? Who do we think we are? But somebody's got to do it. Heart failure accounts for three or four hundred thousand deaths every year in the United States alone. But if we had something on a shelf in a box that we could take off and sew in as a replacement for the diseased heart, then anybody could get one when they needed one. That'll be one of the biggest advances in modern medicine in the last hundred years. And so that's what Frazier and I are trying to do. Everybody in cardiac surgery knows who Bud Frazier is. So he's been involved in this field from the onset. Incredibly innovative, brilliant surgeon, brilliant scientist. Oh, Christ. But anyway, these new glasses I'm not used to. Either. Frazier came up with the absolute pure distilled essence of Eureka when he said, cut out the whole heart and replace it with two turbines. I remember as a medical student massaging the heart of a young boy. I thought then if my hand could keep this young boy alive, why can't we make a pump that would keep uh, him alive? Because of the mechanism that pumps like these use to propel the blood, a rapidly spinning rotor, the flow is continuous like in a garden hose. There's no heartbeat. And that's physiology that hasn't been seen in the last 500 million years of evolution. We needed a place to put the pumps together, and uh, the garage at my house I've turned into a shop. And so I set up a little station there out of things that were available from Home Depot. This was cutting and sewing. This is like putting together a balsa and tissue airplane. With that material, we went into the animal lab and started doing our experiments. And we would cut out the entire heart. We insert the inflows of the pumps. Amazingly, the next day, these animals wake up, they pee, they poop. And yet, if you listen to their chest with a stethoscope, you hear nothing. By all criteria that we conventionally use to analyze patients, they're dead. We did this in over 50 calves before even contemplating doing it in a human being. But in March of this year, we encountered a gravely ill patient named Craig Lewis. In this patient's case, he had a disease called amyloidosis, which is a mortal illness. In amyloidosis, you have a rogue population of cells in your bone marrow that are cranking out protein that your body has no use for. And this amyloid material built up in his heart to the extent that his heart had failed. He was going to die in the next 12 to 24 hours. But this was his only shot. Can you hold the breathing? Uh, uh, stay on. Here you go. Oh, All right, go back on. up to a little leader. The following day, he was completely stable. Did you talk to him after he woke up? Yeah. yeah. How did he seem? He was alert and smile, you know, big thumbs up thing. He was writing, he was working on his computer. I don't know, we, we've got some pictures of him.
He was red and ruber, and his lungs were working well. No heartbeat, no pulse, flat line pressure. We even got him off the breathing machine. He'd been on it for over two weeks. But uh, after five weeks, we found that he actually had the amyloidosis in his lung as well. The patient's disease was just too far advanced. I mean, it was very painful to watch him die. But that's one of the reasons you have to keep trying to keep improving uh, these technologies and treatments. That's what medicine is about, and it's your obligation to these uh, patients. There will come a day, I can tell you, there will come a day when continuous flow artificial hearts are commonplace and save tons of lives. And I think it shows tremendous promise.